Perplexity is part search engine, part LLM. So how does it work? And what role does each part of that, the search and the LLM play in uh, serving the final result? Perplexity is best described as an answer engine. So you ask it a question, you get an answer. Except the difference is all the answers are backed by sources. This is like how an academic writes a paper. Now, that referencing part, the sourcing part, is where the search engine part comes in. So you combine traditional search, extract results relevant to the query the user asked. You read those links, extract the relevant paragraphs, feed it into an LLM. LLM means large language model. And that LLM takes the relevant paragraphs, looks at the query, and comes up with a well-formatted answer with appropriate footnotes to every sentence it says. Because it's been instructed to do so, it's been instructed with that one particular instruction of given a bunch of links and paragraphs, write a concise answer for the user with the appropriate citation. So the magic is all of this working together in one single orchestrated product. And that's what we build perplexity for. So it was explicitly instructed to uh, write like an academic, essentially. You, you found a bunch of stuff on the internet and now you generate something coherent and uh, something that humans will appreciate and cite the things you found on the internet in the narrative you create for the human. Correct. When I wrote my first paper, uh, the senior people who are working with me on the paper told me this one profound thing, which is that every sentence you write in a paper should be backed with a citation, with a with a citation from another peer-reviewed paper or an experimental result in your own paper. Anything else that you say in the paper is more like an opinion. That's it's it's a very simple statement, but pretty profound in how much it forces you to say things that are only right. And we took this principle and asked ourselves, what is the best way to make chatbots accurate? Is force it to only say things that it can find on the internet, right? And find from multiple sources. So this kind of came out of a need rather than, oh, let's try this idea. When we started the startup, there were like so many questions all of us had because we were complete noobs never built a product before, never built like a startup before. Of course, we had worked on like a lot of cool engineering and research problems, but doing something from scratch is the ultimate test. And there were like lots of questions, you know, what is the health insurance, like the first employee we hired, he came and asked us for health insurance, normal need, I didn't care. I was like, why do I need a health insurance this company dies, like who cares? Um, my other two co-founders had were married, so they had health insurance to their spouses. But this guy was like looking for health insurance. And I didn't even know anything. Who are the providers? What is co-insurance or deductible? Or like none of these made any sense to me. And you go to Google, insurance is a category where like a major ad spend category. So even if you ask for something, you know, Google has no incentive to give you clear answers. They want you to click on all these links and read for yourself because all these insurance providers are bidding to get your attention. So we integrated a Slack bot that just pings GPT 3.5 and answered a question. Now, sounds like problem solved, except we didn't even know whether what it said was correct or not. And in fact, it was saying incorrect things. And we were like, okay, how do we address this problem? And we remembered our academic roots uh, you know, Dennis and myself were both academics. Dennis is my co-founder. And we said, okay, what is one way we stop ourselves from saying nonsense in a peer review paper? We're always making sure we can cite what it says, what, what, we, what we write every sentence. Now, what if we ask the chatbot to do that? And then we realized that's literally how Wikipedia works. In Wikipedia, if you do a random edit, people expect you to actually have a source for that. And not just any random source, they expect you to make sure that the source is notable. You know, there are so many standards for like what counts as notable and not. So we decided this is worth working on and it's not just a problem that will be solved by a smarter model because there's so many other things to do on the search layer and the sources layer and making sure like how well the answer is formatted and presented to the user. So that's why the product exists. Well, there's a lot of questions to ask there, but 
first zoom out once again. So fundamentally, it's about search. So you said first there's a search element, mm -hmm. and then there's a storytelling element via LLM, and the, the citation element. But it's about search first. So mm -hmm. you think of perplexity as a search engine. Mm -hmm. I think of perplexity as a knowledge discovery engine. Neither a search engine, I mean, of course, we call it an answer engine, but everything matters here. Uh, the journey doesn't end once you get an answer. In my opinion, the journey begins after you get an answer. You see related questions at the bottom, suggested questions to ask. Why? Because maybe the answer was not good enough, or the answer was good enough, but you probably want to dig deeper and ask more. And that's why in, in, in the search bar, we say where knowledge begins, because there's no end to knowledge. You can only expand and grow. Like That's the whole concept of the beginning of Infinity Book by David Dosh. You always seek new knowledge. So I see this as sort of a discovery process. You start, you, you know, let's say you literally, whatever you ask me to right now, you could have asked perplexity too. Mm -hmm. Hey, perplexity, is it a search engine or is it an answer engine or what is it? And then like you see some questions at the bottom, right? We're gonna straight up ask this right now. I don't know, I don't, I don't know how it's gonna work. <laughs> is uh, perplexity a search engine or an answer engine? That's a poorly phrased question. But one of the things I love about perplexity, the poorly phrased questions will nevertheless lead to interesting directions. Perplexity is primarily described as an answer engine rather than a traditional search engine. Key points showing the difference between answer engine versus search engine. Uh, <laughs> this is so nice. And it compares perplexity versus a traditional search engine like Google. So Google provides a, a list of links to websites. Perplexity focuses on providing direct answers and th synthesizing information from various sources. User experience, technological approach. Uh, so there's an AI integration with Wikipedia-like responses. And this is really well done. And, and you look at the bottom, right? You're right. So you you were not intending to ask those questions, but they're relevant. Like, can perplexity replace Google? For everyday searches. All right, let's click on that. By the way, really interesting generation. That task, that step of generating related searches, so the next step of the yeah. curiosity journey of expanding yeah. your knowledge is really interesting. Exactly, so that's what David Dosh says in his book, which is, for creation of new knowledge starts from the spark of curiosity to seek explanations, and then you find new phenomenon or you get more depth in whatever knowledge you already have. I really love the steps that the pro search is doing. Compare perplexity and Google for everyday searches. Step two, evaluate strengths and weaknesses of perplexity. Evaluate strengths and weaknesses of Google. <laughs> it's like a procedure. Yeah. Complete. Okay, answer. Perplexity AI, while impressive, is not yet a full replacement for Google for everyday searches. Yes. Here are the key points based on the provided sources. Strength of perplexity AI, direct answers, AI powered summaries, focused search, user experience. We can dig into the details of a lot of these. Weaknesses of perplexity AI, accuracy and speed. Interesting. I don't know if that's accurate. Well, Google Google is faster than perplexity because you instantly render the links. The latency is yeah. Best. It's like you get two hundred, you know, three hundred to four hundred milliseconds results. Interesting. Here it's like you know still not about a thousand milliseconds here, right? For simple navigational queries such as finding a specific website, Google is more efficient and reliable. So if you actually want to get straight yeah. to the source, yeah, you just want to go to kayak. Yeah, you just want to go fill up a form. Like you want to go like pay your credit card dues. Real-time information, Google excels in providing real-time information like sports score. So like, while I think Perplexity is trying to integrate yeah. real-time, like recent information, put priority on recent information yeah. that require that's like a lot of work to integrate. Exactly, because that's not just about throwing an LLM. Uh, you, like when you're asking, oh, like what, what dress should I wear out today in Austin? Um, you don't you do want to get the weather across the time of the day, even though you didn't ask for it. And then Google presents this information in like cool widgets. Um, and I think that is where, this is a very different problem from just building another chatbot. And, and, and the information needs to be presented well. And, and the user intent, like for example, if you ask for a stock price, uh, you might even be interested in looking at the historic stock price, even though you never asked for it. You might be interested in today's price. These are the kind of things that like, 
you have to build as custom UIs for every query. And why I think this is a hard problem. It's not just like the next generation model will solve the previous generation models problems here. The next generation model will be smarter. You can do these amazing things like planning, like query, breaking it down to pieces, collecting information, aggregating from sources, using different tools, those kind of things you can do. You can keep answering harder and harder queries, but there's still a lot of work to do on the product layer in terms of how the information is best presented to the user and how you think backwards from what the user really wanted and might want as a next step and give it to them before they even ask for it. But I don't know how much of that is a UI problem of designing custom UIs for a specific set of questions. Mm -hmm. I think at the end of the day, Wikipedia looking uh, UI is good enough mm -hmm. if the raw content that's provided, mm -hmm. the text content mm -hmm. is, is powerful. So if I wanna know the weather mm -hmm. in Austin, if it like gives me five little pieces of information around that, mm -hmm. maybe the weather today and maybe uh, other links to say, do you want hourly? And maybe it gives a little extra information about rain and yeah. temperature, all that kind of stuff. Yeah, exactly. But you would like the product. When you ask for weather, uh, let's say it localizes you to Austin automatically. And not just tell you it's hot, not just tell you it's humid, but also tells you what to wear. You, you wouldn't ask for what to wear, but it would be amazing if the product came and told you what to wear. How much of that could be made much more powerful with some memory, with some personalization. A lot more, definitely. I mean, but the personalization, there's an 80-20 here. The 80-20 is achieved uh, with your location, let's say your gender, and then, you know, like, like sites you typically go to, like a rough sense of topics of what you're interested in. All that can already give you a great personalized experience. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have to like have infinite memory, infinite context windows, have access to every single activity you've done. That's an overkill. Yeah, yeah. I mean, humans are creatures of habit. Most of the time we do the same thing. And Yeah. It's like first few principal vectors. <laughs> first few principal vectors. First, like most, most important eigenvectors. Yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you for reducing humans to that, <laughs> to the most important eigenvectors. Right. But like for me, usually I check the weather if I'm going running. So it's important for the system to know that mm -hmm. running is an activity exactly. that I do. But and, also depends on like you know when do you when you run like if you're asking in the night maybe you're not looking for running but right but then that that starts to get into details really yeah. I never ask at night with exactly. weather because I don't care so like usually it's always going to be a running uh, about running and even at night it's going to be about running because I love running at night. <laughs>